Before I get into this, I need to make something clear. This isn't happening right now. I'm not going to beg for advice or help, because I'm beyond any of your help. I've had to give up everything in my life that ever mattered. This happened more than nine years ago, and I'm finally taking the risk of sharing it. World events are seriously scaring me, and I have more personal reasons that I'll get into later. To post this, I've driven around for 40 minutes before I finally found an unsecured internet connection. I'm not risking posting this from my own. I have made a throwaway account that has no ties to anything related to my life. I'm well and truly fucked, and it's all because of this email that I should have never received. In the summer of 2005, I thought I had everything I would ever need from life. I had just finished grad school and had begun teaching English at a local community college. I had married the love of my life that January in an awesome and geeky ceremony. We had moved into a fix-it-up bungalow on three acres of land. We had rescued an elk hound puppy from the local shelter. Life was good. Looking back, I wish I had enjoyed those days more. I'll call my wife Faye, it's not a real name. Faye and I had just finished working outside one night in July. We were relaxing with a beer on the porch. Fireflies were doing their little, I'll glow, you glow, we all fuck like rabbits dance. And our puppy was gnawing on a pair of my socks I had tied into a knot for him. I asked Faye if she would mind if I checked my email before going to bed. I was expecting a notification about the three classes I was going to teach in the fall, and was looking forward to actually using my degree. Faye went up to bed, and I logged into my work email. There wasn't an email from my department chair, but there was a new email entitled, Progress of EBOV-7X. I figured it was spam, but I impulsively clicked on it anyway. The email's intended address was literally two letters off from mine, and it came with an attachment named E-7X Results and Suggestions. It was addressed to a man named Mark, and it read as follows. Mark, attached to the preliminary results from the last batch of tests of the EBOV-7. The X generation seems to be holding up much better to the modifications. Remember, this is eyes only. So don't print this out or anything. You're new here. And we all think your help is really what's gotten us off the ground on this. If you have anything to add, let me know ASAP. Provided this gen holds up, we'll have a much better quarterly report for the bigwigs than we did last time. Don't wear the tie with a mustard stain on it again, okay? Sincerely, Reagan. I had no clue who either of these people were, and I didn't recognize the domain name of the email address. The only part I can make out was Dietrich. As I finished reading it, Faye called and asked if I was ready to head to bed. I told her I would only be a minute. The cursor was hovering over the download link for the PDF file. Every reasonable part of me said just to delete the email and pretend I never saw it. But, as you can probably tell, I was youthful and impulsive. I clicked the download link. And after a few seconds, the file popped up in my downloads folder. I opened it, fully expecting it to be password locked. I mean, from the tone of the email, wouldn't you? It wasn't. And fuck, I wish it had been. After it opened, I was bombarded with sentences so thick with scientific lingo that I had difficulty even reading them out. I was a language arts major for fuck's sake. There was one diagram that I recognized, though, from having a friend in undergrad who majored in epidemiology. It looked like this. For those of you who don't know, that's Ebola. I skimmed down until I finally found a paragraph that summarized what I had been struggling to read. With the iteration of the EBOV-7 and the hiring of new personnel, we believe that we have addressed the main desires of the client. EBOV-7X contains the following alterations from the base EBOV-0. A. Increased incubation time of 12 to 40 days, as opposed to EBOV-O incubation of 2 to 12 days. B. Suppress the lack of appetite common in EBOV-0, thus removing one of the major diagnosable tools. C. Increased durability of the virus allowing it to remain hot up to 8 hours outside the human body, 
See test 100 BA for applicable data. D. Rate of fever increased by 20%, allowing for upwards of 35% more time before a patient becomes immobilized. I pushed my chair away from the computer and simply stared at it for a minute. I rubbed my eyes and reread the paragraph over and over again. I couldn't believe what I was reading. What would be the point to this? Who would want these changes to an already deadly virus? Taking in a deep breath, I forced myself to relax. I wasn't an expert on anything related to Ebola, but one of my strengths has always been the ability to think outside the box and move past my own internal assumptions. I asked myself, what purpose would these changes have, and what would be the goal behind it? As I asked myself that, the answer came to me quickly. It wasn't about making a vaccine or wanting to remove the danger from the virus. Someone was altering Ebola to make it less noticeable and less easily diagnosable. Someone was cultivating a version of Ebola that wouldn't burn itself out. A version of Ebola that could be a pandemic. Holy shit. Holy. Fucking. Shit. I copied the file onto a USB stick and put it in my messenger bag I used for work. I marked the email as unread and deleted it. Then I went upstairs to bed. As Faye snored beside me and the puppy curled itself onto the crook of my neck, sleep did not find me. I had no clue what to do. Should I go to the police? The news? Should I just forget it ever happened? Eventually I fell asleep and got up the next morning. I debated telling Faye about the email. I never kept anything from her in the four years that we have dated, but I decided against it. For all I knew, it was nothing, and there was no reason to worry her. I drove to work and tried to forget about it. I worked on getting my office space situated to my liking. I was about to call Faye to meet for lunch, when two men in dark suits knocked on the open door. Yes? I asked. Dr. George? One of them asked. No, that's not my real name. You won't find my real name. Yes, I repeated. This is Dr. Wren, and I'm Dr. Frawl, one of them said. If you asked me now, I wouldn't be able to tell you which was which. They were both middle-aged white men, brown hair, clean-shaven, and wearing dark sunglasses. You may have received an email from our company server by mistake last night. Did you? Ah, oh, shit. Okay, I'm gonna have to cut it off here. The family whose Wi-Fi I'm ripping off have looked out the window four times at my car. And now someone has a phone in their hand. I'll have to be more careful next time. I'll be back as soon as I can. Stay safe. Okay, back everybody. I'm being a bit more careful this time. I'm still hijacking this family's Wi-Fi to post this, but I'm here in the middle of the day now. The only one home, from what I can see, is the wife, and she hasn't noticed me yet. Some of you probably are wondering why I even bother driving 40 minutes to do this. I'm not even comfortable writing this out on my own home network, let alone posting it from there. I have lived in 60 different cities since this happened. I like where I am now, and I really don't want to have to move again. Anyway, when I had to cut out last time, I had just been approached by two men in suits. At that moment, I had never been so appreciative of my grandparents teaching me how to play poker. I frowned, and looked upward to the left, acting like I was trying to remember. In case you're wondering, the idea of looking up and to the left suggesting that you're telling the truth while the opposite suggests that you're lying, is actually a myth. However, that doesn't stop people from believing it. I told them that I had received it, but that I marked it as spam and deleted it. Would you mind showing us? One of them asked. He smiled and took off his sunglasses, probably in an attempt to appear more cordial. The second kept his glasses on, which made it impossible to see where he was looking. If we don't ask, our bosses are guaranteed to give us hell for it, no sunglasses said. 
I agreed and logged on to my university email. I pulled up the trash folder and showed them the apparently unread email. We really do apologize for this. We have been installing new internal servers and we have been having trouble with stored addresses and queuing emails. The new system is meant to automatically find the correct email address. It's been attaching the wrong domain names to IDs that are close. They watched as I deleted it. They seemed content. Each of them shook my hand, reminded me that the email was under corporate non-disclosure, and walked out. As soon as they were gone, I shut the door and collapsed into the chair at the computer. What kind of company was this? How in the world did they find me, find out where I worked, and sent people in less than 24 hours? I looked at the USB stick in my bag, but I didn't touch it. In some weird way, I worried that I had damned myself, but I couldn't shake the feeling that it would end up being more important than not. I finished up my workday and headed home. The next day was Saturday, and we needed to mow. Some of you may think, why would mowing take a whole day? I can only respond by saying that one of the downsides of having land is having to take care of it. We had two tractors so that Faye and I could mow at the same time and finish in as little time as required. Before I explain what happened that Saturday, you need to understand something. Without fail, I service those tractors every time after we use them. I clean the mower decks, sharpen the blades when they need it, and double check the engine. I check the oil and gas before and after using them. Yeah, I'm a little OCD, but it's been more help than harm. Faye and I each typically use the same tractor, but she told me that her tractor felt like it was pulling to the left instead of going straight. I told her to use mine, and that I would check it out. She started the tractor and began to mow our field. The tractor worked fine for 15 minutes, and then the engine began to sputter and cough. I noticed it, and waved for Faye to stop. She did, shutting the tractor off and starting to walk towards me. Several things happened all at once. I stood up, walking to meet my wife halfway. Faye walked towards me smiling. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a dark maroon sedan slow down as it drove past our house. The tractor then exploded behind my wife into a fireball. Pieces of metal and rubber flew in every direction, and the shockwave knocked Faye forward onto the ground. The blast of heat hit me in the face, and it felt like I had dropped face first into a bonfire. I ran to her, scared shitless, but she was fine, though the wind had been knocked out of her. I moved her to the garage, told her to call 911, and ran back to the burning husk of my tractor with a fire extinguisher. I used the entire extinguisher, but I couldn't get the blaze to totally stop. The next few hours were a blur. The fire department showed up, followed by police. The neighbors gawked from their front porches, and we were asked the same questions again and again. The cops asked if either of us had any reason to suspect foul play. God help me. I should have mentioned the meeting with the two men at work and the email, but I kept my mouth shut. What would I have said anyway? Well, gee, officer, I received an email last night from a company making a biological weapon out of Ebola, and today two men in dark suits showed up at my work to ask me about it in a vaguely threatening manner. I would have laughed at that myself had someone else said it. By the time everyone left, we were exhausted and starving. We loaded up our puppy into my car and went to Faye's parents' place where her dad cooked on the grill and I got lectured on the importance of taking care of my tools. The thing is, I did, and still do. After dinner, we went back to our home. There was a huge circle of blackened dirt and burnt grass in the field where the tractor had exploded, but otherwise there was no sign of the circus that had filled our lives only a few hours earlier. Faye was exhausted, and she went straight to bed. I couldn't sleep. I kept running over every check to the tractor that I had done, trying to see where I could have gone wrong. The fuel lines weren't loose. No matter what my father-in-law insinuated, there had been no reason for it to explode. 
Now properly feeling my paranoia, I needed to double check the other major property that I gave my OCD an outlet on. My guns. Yes, I own guns. I grew up around them, and they're only tools. Treat them with the proper respect, and there's nothing inherently wrong with them. We had a shotgun in the living room. On top of the TV stand, there was a handgun in the kitchen. A holster screwed into the bottom of the cupboards behind the fluorescent light for the counter and a revolver my wife kept on her nightstand. Lastly, I kept a mare's leg in the basement, hidden in the pantry behind the rows of mason jars, filled with pears and peaches. I cleaned my guns every Sunday, dissembling them and making sure they're in order. As I walked through the house checking each gun, I noticed the firing pens were missing. Let me repeat that. The firing pens from the guns I clean every Sunday like clockwork, were missing. The only gun that hadn't been tampered with was the mare's leg downstairs. The lines of dust hadn't been disrupted, and the gun was still able to fire without any complications. I went back upstairs and sat in the living room, trying to let my wife rest, while I had a mental meltdown. In a span of less than 24 hours, I learned a company was weaponizing Ebola had been confronted by men in suits who claimed to represent that company, had one of my tractors explode nearly killing my wife, and had come to find someone had tampered with my belongings in an attempt to make me unable to defend myself. What the fuck was going on here? My first concern was for Faye. Was someone targeting both of us? Just her? How would I be able to protect her? I thought back over the day and remembered the maroon sedan had been driving past when the tractor exploded. There was nothing noteworthy about it, but an instinct told me to watch for it again. I added a gun shop to my to-do list on the fridge and went to sleep, resolving to keep an eye out for the sedan. It didn't help. Over the next weeks, I recognized a pattern of three distinct cars following my wife and I around town. There was a black Honda, the maroon sedan, and a dark blue motorcycle. When I would take the puppy outside, one would be driving down the road while I was outside. When we would go to the movies, one would be parked within five spaces of our car. I even started to notice them at family gatherings, driving past when one of my cousins had a birthday party, or when we visited Faye's grandmother at the nursing home. At the same time, more accidents began to occur around our home. The heat would miraculously go out, only for a repairman to say that we lucked out, because if I hadn't come when I did, you'd have a pretty serious build of a carbon monoxide in here. The springs on the garage doors suddenly began failing, almost crushing the puppy when I was working outside. The power brakes went out on my car, forcing me to cruise down the lane on a highway until I eased to a stop and put the emergency brakes on. Did they know? Somehow? that I had downloaded that information and kept it? Were these really accidents? Were attempts on my life? After three weeks of this, I got out of bed in the middle of the night and checked my guns again. No missing pieces. I then sat in the dark to think. Deleting the information wouldn't help. If they knew I had it, they wouldn't know if I deleted it. And if push came to shove, it was the only leverage I had. The email had come to me by mistake, so it wouldn't be logical to assume that Faye had read it. She had been on the tractor I usually used when it exploded. It was clear to me that I had been meant to be on it, not her. The accidents had only started around the house since the visit by the two men, Wren and Frawl. I hadn't seen them again in person, but the trio of vehicles were ever-present. The real part of me wanted to take my guns and go hunting, but this wasn't the Wild West. I wasn't going to risk someone getting shot in crossfire. I wasn't sure if the police would accept my story. If this company had the capacity to find me in less than 24 hours, how could I be sure they wouldn't fabricate evidence against me? Should I tell Faye about all of this? She was my wife, my partner. I knew that she would be in my corner 100%, but I could not risk her safety. I know this sounds chauvinistic. I assure you that's not the case. Faye was more talented than I in a lot of areas, 
but I was raised to believe that a man protects his family, no matter what. Discounting the problems with the ventilation systems, everything that had happened was directed at me. If I told her, she would become a legitimate target as I apparently was. As long as these people kept trying to proactively silence a leak, my wife would be in danger of being collateral damage. Her remaining that way was not an option. I had to think of a way to ensure her safety permanently. I was out of options, at least the ones that left me in a position I wanted to be in, namely with my wife, safe, in the life that we had built. The only option I had left that would keep me alive and keep my wife and family safe was one that I did not want to do. I had to disappear, vanish out of the clear blue sky, and make it as close to impossible as I could to be followed. Once I was off the grid, I would find a way to either expose the company or make some kind of deal with them. I couldn't expect Faye to follow me, nor would I want to expose her to that level of danger. I would have to abandon the love of my life, every accomplishment I had earned, in order to survive this, at least temporarily. I was so fucked. Back again. I'm not sure if it's just because I miss everything that made my life familiar, but this family has really made me smile. Just knowing that normal life continues, you know? I've mentioned that I've lived in 60 cities, which sounds like a lot. Some were as short as a week, others were a few months. But once you start moving, it's hard to stop. When you decide to disappear, it isn't nearly as easy as it sounds. Everyone tends to assume that it's easy to drop off the grid, just to walk away from the life you've lived up to that point and choose a new path. It isn't. At least, not if you don't want to eventually be found again. It isn't as simple as, take the money out of the bank, stop going to work, go to a new town. To give myself a head start and to make sure it was clear that Faye wasn't involved, I had to do the legwork and provide misinformation to the people chasing me. I'm not going to go into a whole breakdown of how I managed to vanish. If you really want to plan it yourself, there are plenty of materials available. I'm just going to give an overview to make it clear how I approached the whole thing. First, I gave business cards and cash to friends who worked overseas. I told them that they would be doing me a huge favor, and nobody suspected anything, or if they did, they never voiced their concerns. One went to China, and another went to Western Europe. Every time they left a card, it was a marker that someone would have to investigate at a cursory level at least, which would buy some time. Two of our friends had just gotten married, and went to South America for their honeymoon. We went to their house for a dinner party. I excused myself and quickly photoshopped tiny images of my face into the crowds behind the couple's smiling selfies. When the photos were posted on Facebook, any kind of facial recognition would hopefully find me in the background and again demand some level of investigation. Lastly, I randomly picked four towns off of a map. I bought a prepaid cell phone and when I should have been working, I looked up apartments for rent in those locations. I called and made appointments to look, appointments I never intended to keep. I called water services, cable and internet providers, magazine companies, all to set up subscriptions or knowingly false installation dates. For the people reading this who recoil and think to themselves, what a jackass, you can bottle your displeasure. When a company like that comes to a place to make an installation and there isn't anyone there, they simply don't do it. It's no skin off their nose. For the callback numbers on all these appointments, I made sure to give the number to the nearest police or federal authority station. I doubted the people who sent the email would be worried, but I fully intended to make it clear that I was meeting them step for step. For every sales plan or rewards program I belonged to, I called and changed my information slightly. I purposefully misspelled my name or had them fix my address to one of four towns I had picked, or to a P.O. box I had prepared just for this. Everything was done for one purpose, to make it as time-consuming as possible to hunt down every lead I could place, in order to give me time to find a way out of this mess. 
To make sure I didn't lose the information that I had saved on the USB drive from the email, I printed everything out twice and sent each of the copies to different PO boxes owned by private companies. Again, this isn't a how-to, but this is an easy way to break it down. Box A, fake everything. Town I never planned on visiting. Box B, fake everything. And again, a town I never planned on visiting. Box C, real, sent one copy here. Town adjacent to a place I was familiar with. Box D, real, the town where I planned on disappearing to to start with. The whole time, I had to keep Faye in the dark. It killed me to see her smiling, or playing with our dog, and hearing her murmur, I love you, as she fell asleep next to me. If I had been able, I would have rewound the clock just before I had opened that damn email, and continued to sit with her for as long as I was able. I managed to keep my misinformation building efforts away from her, but the accidents kept happening. Our oven broke, and the heating element didn't stop getting hotter. I had to shut off the power to the whole house in order to avert a fire. On my way to work, the stoplight glitched just as it turned green for me, staying green for the opposing lanes as well. I almost got t-boned by an old man driving a midlife crisis mobile. I had to grip the steering wheel extra tight to keep from yelling. One afternoon, Faye took Sigmund, we had finally named our little dog, out for a walk in the backyard. I heard her scream and ran outside with the shotgun. I didn't know what to expect, but I knew that I wasn't going down without a fight. She was holding our puppy and shaking and pointed out to the field. Even from that distance, I could make out the timber rattler moving through the grass. She told me the puppy had noticed it before she did, and she just barely had time to yank back on the leash and move away before the snake had coiled up onto itself and began rattling. I walked out, aimed, and suddenly there was cooling snake blood over a five-foot circle. Faye was shaken and asked me if I had ever seen one before. I answered her no, and while we were technically in the range for one, I had never seen a snake like that in a populated area like where we lived. These accidents were getting more and more desperate. I have no doubt that if they simply wanted me dead, they could have shot me. From my own perspective, it seemed apparent to me that the desired outcome was to silence me permanently without any foul play being suspected at all. I didn't have any time left. I disappeared on an early Tuesday morning. I had seen a lawyer previously and drawn up divorce papers. I gave Faye everything short of a few hundred dollars. I didn't want to divorce her, but I had to keep propping up the fact that she didn't know anything about E-7X or plans to weaponize Ebola. I kissed her on the cheek as she slept and quietly got dressed. I had only been packing for a few days, a bar of soap here, a shirt there, and now I was ready to go without any more packing. As I got up, Sigmund yawned and looked up at me, his tail wagging. I had to bite my tongue to keep from crying as I scratched behind his ears, trying to commit to memory his smell and the feel of face skin under my hand. I signed the divorce papers and left them on the kitchen counter. I tried to write a note to give some kind of explanation, but nothing came. At least nothing that would keep her safely ignorant of why I had to leave. I just ended up writing, I'm sorry, I'll always love you, and left it at that. I left behind everything I ever loved, in a last ditch effort to keep them all safe. It was lonely and terrifying, and I've been on the run since 2005. It's been nine years. Nine long, lonely years. I never stopped moving the first two years. I never stayed in one place for more than two months before packing up and moving. I worked odd jobs, always got paid under the table in cash. I lied with a smile every time someone asked me where I was from or about the ring I wore around my neck. I've tried three times over the years to get the evidence I have to people who might be able to help me. Two were politicians and one was a news person. I suspect you'll recognize their names. Larry Craig, Anthony Weiner, and Tim Russert. I pick the politicians not because they're tough on bioweapons, 
or the vast military industrial complex, but because they represented states far away from my own. When I reached out to Craig on August 23rd, his staff seemed remote, but interested. Four days after, I turned on the radio and heard that Roe Call was reporting that he had been arrested for lewd conduct. Holy shit. I went underground again after that, for the better part of a year, moving and always keeping an eye over my shoulder. I reached out to Russert next, contacting his staff and explaining that I had a story that I would only trust to Russert himself. I was a fan of Meet the Press for a number of years, and always appreciated that he never seemed to play favorites. I daydreamed about my life turning out like something from the Pelican Brief, reuniting with Faye, seeing my parents again, my old employers offering my job back out of pride for my accomplishments. I heard back from them on June 10th of 2008, where his chief of staff explained that Tim would be contacting me personally to set something up. On June 13th, Russ Sirt died of an apparent heart attack. I cleared out of my apartment and was on the next Greyhound bus out of town. After that, I left the United States for several years. It was easier to hide in more populated areas. And while my facility with other languages was never fantastic, I knew enough to pass by. I came back to the US in late 2010 and decided to attempt to go public again. I then contacted a junior congressman from New York, someone on the opposing side of the political aisle for my first attempt. I actually spoke with Anthony Weiner himself, and he offered me protection and his full support in exchange for the information I had. We verbally agreed, and I even traveled to New York City to meet him. We had agreed to meet in a nondescript corner restaurant, but he never showed. I waited for an hour, but nothing. My off-the-grid instincts were screaming, and I vanished into a dive bar. On the TV, I saw the story, a sex scandal, where Wiener had been having online affairs. His credibility was totally shot. I finished my beer and disappeared out of the city again. I've been underground ever since, and this is the first time I've used any kind of social media since. We've come to my secondary reason for posting this. I know Faye got remarried, and I know my mother still holds a ceremony for me every year on my birthday, and my father died without knowing what happened to his son. I know that Faye was really into Reddit at the start of the site, and this subreddit is exactly the kind of thing that she would be into. It's remote, a one in a million chance, but there's a possibility that she could see this. Faye, if you can hear this, please know that I love you. I have never stopped loving you. I never wanted to hurt you. And everything I've done has been to keep you safe. I know you haven't sold the house yet. I lurk online using proxies and public internet access. There's a lockbox buried under the third fence post away from the road. It has the first book we ever read to each other, and a handwritten copy of my wedding vows. I had hoped to give it to you on our 30th wedding anniversary, but that's not looking likely. Do what you want with it. I love you. This is my final entry. Okay, I can't stay here long. I wanted to address a few things in a longer post, but events have happened to make that no longer an option. This will be the last update in a very, very long time. When I woke up this morning, I turned on the radio and realized I messed up. I messed up bad. The families whose internet I've been using suffered a home invasion last night. The news is reporting that a team of four masked men stormed into their house at three in the morning. The intruder shot the family dog, killing it instantly. They proceeded to torture the family, shooting the husband in the stomach and forcing the wife and two kids to watch him die. By the time the police got there, the intruders were gone. They murdered him. They also cut three of the eldest child's fingers off. The police reports were saying the intruders were asking about a man matching my description. Though the family didn't know anything. All because I stole their internet and posted this. I'm waiting at a bus station now. I need to disappear again. Though hopefully I can do something for the family whose lives I managed to destroy. 
I've seen a lot of your comments about going to WikiLeaks, of being a hero. I never wanted to be a hero. And you can call me a coward if you want. All I wanted was a normal life with my wife and a dog and maybe some kids. I need to find a way to get back to that, if at all possible. This isn't a video game or an action movie. I can't just walk into a building with a gun and automatically assume everyone will recognize me as the protagonist. Nor can I just walk into a newspaper or a TV station and have my life be fixed. I've contacted WikiLeaks once to assuage my fears of what happened with Russert. In the 24 hours it took them to contact me, there were men in the town I was in at the time already asking around about me. This isn't worth my life, and that's that. I haven't contacted Faye. Her new husband is old money, and she appears to be doing just fine. I saw that some of you suspect he's in on this somehow, but I doubt it. I'm going to try to find a way to slip some kind of message to her, I think. There's been someone contacting me claiming to be with the company, and said that my trip to Europe didn't do anything. If you're real, thanks for proving it did. I never went to Europe, you idiots. Facial recognition will never outpace the human element. Lastly, to the people claiming to be the companies hired by my wife to indulge my paranoid delusions, I congratulate you on your imagination. That's it. I wish I could laugh it off as easily as you. Well, goodbye. Thank you for listening and giving me some solid human contact. Goodbye, Faye. Please, forgive me. There's always a reason.